Hey everyone, Dr. David Clark here. Today I'm going to walk you through another real patient case study from my office. This is from a few years ago. Uh, I didn't have some of the testing then that I have now, but I thought there'd still be a great case to share with some of you. So this is a 48-year-old man diagnosed with Meniere's disease. So he has hearing loss and he's also having dizziness. So if you have Meniere's disease and you've got hearing loss and it's not getting better or it's unstable, I think you're going to like this case because it's going to be really helpful. All right, so if we just kind of dive into the chief complaints, his hearing in his left ear is worse than the right ear. Now, both are bad, but he calls his left ear his bad ear. Uh, he has three to four episodes of dizziness and vertigo per year. So like, you know, with Meniere's disease, uh, not only do you get hearing loss of variable kinds, but you can also get episodes of vertigo, and he's certainly having that. So let's uh, jump into his history. So at the end of 2012, remember I said this was a few years ago, uh, he was starting to have fullness in his left ear, and that's something you often see in Meniere's cases, is they'll have a, a sense of pressure or a sense of fullness. And really what's happening is you're getting a swelling of the inner ear parts, and it's basically going to crush itself from the inside out. Now, as I'll point out, and I've got a lot of their videos on this, basically what's causing this in, I think in most every case, is an inflammatory problem of some kind. Now, I say that, some people have Meniere's, and it doesn't appear to be any sort of inflammatory problem. I've actually had some cases, and I put one here on YouTube, of a lady whose Meniere's uh, phenotype was not inflammatory as a primary problem. Her primary problem was she had an immune deficiency, which meant she got sick a lot, and those sicknesses were inflammatory. But most people that I see that have Meniere's, whether it's unilateral or bilateral, uh, both ears are one, it's usually some sort of inflammatory problem. And my job is to track that down and figure out what it is. So. Uh, a few months later, he consulted an ENT, and the ENT diagnosed him with, with Meniere's disease due to some hearing loss and his, uh, just his symptoms. And about eight months later, he had tried hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, which is a diuretic, and a steroid injection in his left ear. Now, that's a fairly typical sort of medical ENT sort of thing to do, is they give a diuretic in an attempt to uh, decrease the fluid pressure in the ear, and the steroid injection is basically trying to de-inflame. Now, sometimes that works in some people, and they're fine. Other times it doesn't work, and their symptoms come back. So by September of the next year, uh, he had started a paleo diet, and three months into the diet, his symptoms in his left ear had completely resolved. Now, that's really interesting, right? So we already know, if we analyze his history carefully here, that something in the diet that he was eating must have been provoking to some degree what was going on in his left ear. But of course, that can't still be what's happening because he's ending up seeing me. So March of uh, 2015, he started getting fullness in the right ear. Now, in the old days, people would say, well, if it's not bilateral on both ears, it, it can't be an autoimmune cause for Meniere's disease. Well, I can tell you that I've seen lots and lots of people over the last 20 years, and I don't care if it's right ear, left ear, or both ears, or one ear, it's usually some sort of immune system problem. You gotta track that down. So he's getting it in his right ear. Uh, a few months later, the left ear that was had been fine became worse very acutely and worsened over a course of a few months and then stayed at that level of badness until he saw me uh, the following year. So in April 2016, he had, had a few dizzy episodes, a few vertiginous episodes that seemed to be brought on by light sensitivity, and that's not really a Meniere's, uh, strictly a Meniere sort of pathology, but it still could have happened. But he's also having fluctuating hearing loss now in his right ear. Remember, he had he had fullness in his left ear, then he had some hearing loss. Now he's, and that seemed to resolve with the paleo diet. And then his right ear uh, became worse and his left ear became worse. And now he's having fluctuating hearing loss in his right ear. So he's got the process happening on both sides. Now, at the time he saw me, he'd been taking hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ for three years and was still following that paleo diet. So even though he had a good response to the paleo diet, maybe it was just coincidental because sometimes Meniere's symptoms wax and wane, but it's, it's attractive to think that maybe his diet was making a difference in that, right? All right, so just a couple things from his examination. So quick movements of his head make his symptoms worse. Now, what that is, is when you have Meniere's disease and you're getting kind of this crushing, what you're really doing is you're decreasing the amount of signals that come from the inner ear that get processed in your brain that tell you uh, where you are. And when you move quick, that's called a high, you know, a high frequency movement or high velocity movement. Uh, 
and that's going to accentuate problems with your vestibular ocular reflex or your VOR. So basically we know just when he moves, he makes his head moves quick, his eyes are lagging behind. Uh, and that's going to be a problem. That can cause some dizziness uh, temporarily. He's, he also knows that if he's having a bad episode of hearing decrease in his right ear, because remember it fluctuates, that will often be accompanied uh, by when he is most dizzy, most vertiginous, and also nauseous. And that's, that's just your classic sort of Meniere's uh, combination of things, right? You get the hearing loss that may worsen or a tinnitus may worsen along with the vertiginous symptoms. And so we know that it's a dynamic thing, right? It's fluctuating. He also notes if he goes more than four hours without eating, he feels irritable and a little shaky. Now that's immediately implicating a problem with his hypothalamus pituitary adrenal circuit. And you may say, well, how does that have anything to do with Meniere's? Well, because fluctuations in blood glucose levels can be inflammatory. So we're always looking for what is causing his immune system to be unstable. Is it an autoimmune problem? Is it an inflammatory problem that's manifesting in the ear? There's a lot of things your doctor's got to know to be able to dig through this, right? You don't just give people steroids and go, okay, good. You got to figure out why is it happening, right? We're trying to be a, a good detective. So also in his examination, uh, bedside examination of pursuits, what does that mean? Well, that means, you know, we have a target and just at the bedside or just, you know, sitting here at the table, at the exam table, you know, I'm having him track or pursue. And his pursuits showed what we call large intrusions when traveling to the right, anywhere from zero degrees midline up to 15 to 20 degrees. Now what that means is his eyes, instead of moving at the same speed of the target, his eyes start to lag behind and he gets these big jumps in his uh, pursuits. And that's a compensatory strategy, but it's telling you something's wrong in that circuit that should make his eyes track. And what that is implicating is it's telling us that his Meniere's is starting to affect his cerebellum. And the reason I bring this up is a lot of people with Meniere's, I shouldn't say a lot, but some people with Meniere's that we treat, that I treat metabolically, sometimes they get really good improvement and then they kind of plateau and they still have stuff like this gentleman has. So what do you do? Well, you do brain-based rehabilitation for those people, or what we call receptor-based rehabilitation. I don't talk about that that much uh, here on, on YouTube, but it is something that I do do on some people that need it, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we'd love to know if this fixes this, like what we do for him, does it fix this problem with pursuits? Because when he's trying to track something just in life, he's gonna have some difficulty depending on where he's tracking it, right? He could have to lose the target, and that could be dangerous for driving. Uh, we use this thing called a, a VNG, uh, made by a company called Micromedical, or back then it was Micromedical. He also has a uh, drift of his eyes to the right uh, in this test called spontaneous nystagmus. Basically, uh, you put him in these infrared goggles, it's dark, and that way you can see his eyes, and his eyes drift to the right, which is telling you that there's an imbalance between the right half of his vestibular system and the left half of his vestibular system. And these are just tests that are helping me quantify, okay, how bad is this? Is it just hearing? Is it just uh, tinnitus? Or is it starting to deprive his central brain stem structures like his cerebellum, his vestibular nuclei? Is it starting to make them, uh, I won't say sick in the same way, but is it starting to affect them, right? Is it starting to deprive them of what they need and they start to malfunction? Uh, pursuit testing using the VNG is more computerized and standardized, but again, he's got these intrusions at a certain speed, and it's telling us there's a problem with that circuit, and it's almost 100% going to be caused by his uh, Meniere's. Also, we did this thing called optokinetics, which is where you look at, uh, it's basically like you look at stripes or look at certain patterns, and it elicits a, 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 a visual reflex that we have called optokinetic, and basically you get a a slow and then a fast, and your eyes kind of jerk. It creates a nystagmus uh, that's supposed to happen. Anyway, his is slow, which again is telling us he's got some central compromise, and also uh, with vertical saccades, which are saccades are, uh, if you just look at my eyes, if I jump from here to here, if like if I jump, uh, that's a saccade. If I track, that's a pursuit. Anyway, his saccades are certainly having a problem as well. Now, we did his pre-treatment lab workup, and I'll just tell you, back then I didn't have lymphocyte uh, immunophenotyping. I didn't have the money to do multiple tissue antibody testing, so all I could do was do this regular kind of blood work and see what does that tell me and make my best assessment of what we could do. So uh, his glucose level is slightly high, but you know what? I don't really worry about someone's fasting glucose when it's barely high like that. As you can see, his A1C uh, is totally, uh, his A1C is totally normal. Now the LDH, the LDH is a kind of a surrogate marker that I use to find out how much glucose is actually making it into tissues 
and getting processed. Uh, and my cutoff that I use is about 140. Essentially, if it's below that, people could have trouble getting glucose into tissues, which, if you remember, is kind of what it sounded like he's having a problem with, right? If he goes more than three or four hours without eating, he starts to get kind of, you know, shaky, lightheaded, and that's a very classic example of an HPA axis problem. I won't go into that too much. I just brought it up because that's something that I do do for him is I give him some support uh, for his HPA axis and to help him be able to make uh, cortisol. Now, his homocysteine level is not okay. Now, it's not high by the lab range, but really for my purposes, anything above seven or eight, that's too high. Why do we care? Because homocysteine is inflammatory. It uh, it's promotes oxidative stress. It's very bad for cardiovascular system. Uh, it makes your brain age faster. So it's just something we want to take care of. Now you can see his vitamin D is low. Now I immediately start thinking, okay, I'll just tell you guys, anytime someone's vitamin D is that low, my first thought is I bet this person has an autoimmune condition, whether they know it or not, because there's a kind of a genetic package with having an autoimmune problem and having low vitamin D. Why do we care? Why do we care in the context of Meniere's is because vitamin D is anti-inflammatory. And so we're definitely going to have to fix that. Uh, so hypoglucocytosis is a term I made up. I made that term up to try to describe the situation when someone's blood glucose can't be maintained between eating or they have a hard time getting the glucose into their cell. So it's not hypoglycemia and it's not reactive hypoglycemia. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a flavor of that. And I already mentioned homocysteine is too high and vitamin D too low. Now, usually homocysteine will be high if there's a problem with B12 or folic acid. He didn't have a problem with those. So what's the treatment plan? Well, what do I have to work with? Well, I know from all my experience that Meniere's is highly inflammatory, uh, usually is inflammatory, uh, and he's got a little blood sugar instability. His vitamin D is low. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put him on a, a short-term anti-inflammatory diet. Now, he was already kind of using a paleo diet, but there were a few things on that that, that I didn't like for him. So I kind of gave him a different diet. And then I gave him an anti-inflammatory uh, supplement protocol just because, you know, I've had a lot of experience with that. Does he have any overt markers of inflammation? No, he doesn't. But that doesn't mean he's not inflamed and wouldn't benefit from getting de-inflamed. Now, again, I'm not going to tell you exactly what we did because what we did for him is not necessarily what we would do for you or do for somebody else, especially now because uh, I have the lymphocyte map to look at. But I'm going to support his low HPA tone. Now, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Now, that's not uh, adrenal fatigue. Okay. Adrenal fatigue is something that is sort of a, it seems to make sense to a lot of people, but it really, uh, <laughs> uh, it doesn't exist the way people think that it does. The adrenal glands don't fatigue, except in extremely rare cases where there's an autoimmune problem. Anyway, we're giving him a formula to support that low HPA tone to keep his blood glucose up between eating so that he doesn't have swings in his immune system along with the swings in his blood sugar. So he did decide when we started this, he wanted to stop taking the HCTZ because he didn't think it was making any difference anyway. So after 30 days of the treatment I just described, what happens? Well, he says in 30 days, he's had at least a 50% improvement in the right ear hearing. Okay. That's very cool, right? So this is a guy who's had fluctuating hearing loss and now, and it's not ever really gotten better, but now it's better. Okay. Now that's his subjective report. We don't have a hearing test yet, an audiogram to know if that's really happening, but his subjective experience is that's better. And that is really cool. He says the vast majority of Jay since I saw him last, he's having 95 to 96, 96% normal hearing in his right ear. Now remember his left ear is the really bad one. Uh, the right ear was the better of the two. Now he did say the few days when he did have a, a decrease in hearing in that right ear is when he had days of exceptional stress. Why? Well, Stress can provoke an increase in inflammation. Stress can provoke uh, a change or a surge in your sympathetic nervous system. That might be uh, what it was related to. I think it's probably just because stress is, is inflammatory. It just kind of stoked the fire. And on those days, as a rescue, uh, he did take the HETZ and he thinks maybe it helped. I don't think it did. Now he does though, think he does think the hearing in his left ear, which is the bad ear, may have improved somewhat. He's not sure. So this is very cool. After 30 days of de-inflaming him, he's had a big improvement in right ear hearing and maybe a, a, an improvement in the left ear, which has always been the bad ear. And just to be frank with you, we may never get that ear back. The damage may have been done so much that we're not ever going to get any good hearing back in that left ear. We don't know yet. So what do we do now? Well, hey man, I want you to begin reintroducing foods. Now, that diet I gave him was pretty uh, uh, strict and 
pretty uh, restrictive. And now we're going to begin reintroducing foods as a test. I won't really go into that at this point, except to say that uh, we're not going to do any IgG food testing because that's a waste of time. Continue that anti-inflammatory support uh, protocol. Keep supporting the HPA tone. In about 30 days, we'll recheck his vitamin D and homocysteine to see, you know, are those levels changing the way that we'd like them to. All right, so what happens? Well, after about 60 days, he sends me an email and he says, I had had success adding back in eggs, tomatoes, potatoes, and peppers. Almonds, he was iffy about, as he seems to have more post-nasal drip and throat clearing. Uh, I'm probably going to add black beans or chickpeas next. I would say, right, so far my hearing in the right ear has solidly been at 95 to 100 percent. Okay. I perhaps have some very minor improvement in my left ear. I still can't hear very much out of it, but maybe what I can hear is a little more clear. So this is looking good. This is looking really good. We're two months into it. The right ear is doing great. Left ear may be improving as well. He's been able to add some foods back. So after three months, he saw his otolaryngologist for a hearing test, and he has normal hearing in his right ear now. Normal hearing in his right ear. That's excellent. He's not taking the diuretic for about three months and still feeling good. All right. So what do we do? Well, hey, eat everything but what his personal three big bad, and not big bags, just say big bad foods. Stop taking some of the anti-inflammatory support and see how he does, right? Because I want him to be doing as good as possible, stable, but taking as few things as possible. And the only way to do that is to have him stop taking some of the things, right? But he's going to continue the few things that aren't overtly anti-inflammatory. We'll follow up with him in a month. If he's still doing great, I'll probably say, hey, let's see you like five or six months. Okay. So after four months, not taking the diuretic, he stopped the serious anti-inflammatory support a few weeks ago. His hearing's still been great. Okay. So what do we do now? Stop that HP access support I've been giving him uh, over the next few weeks and then see if he can go four hours without eating and that's it. Like you might feel hungry, but nothing else. Because if that's the case, then we've essentially rehabilitated that HPA axis and he doesn't need it anymore, which would be great. Continue only three, what I call insurance supplements, and then we're going to follow up in a month. If he's still doing well, I'm going to release him to once or twice yearly follow-up visits, you know, assuming nothing else really changes. So after five months, hearing's excellent, no problems. Over Halloween, he had a few pieces of candy that had uh, milk, chocolate in them, and he wasn't sure, but maybe his left ear got a little stuffy. It's possible. It's possible. Milk can do that to some people. He's going to avoid his three big bad foods. He's only going to continue the three insurance supplements. And we're going to follow up in six months. Why? Because he's doing really well. He's doing really, really well. So let's see what happens on a longer time frame. So one year and three months after beginning treatment, no decline in hearing in either ear. Okay? You get that? His right ear is doing great. Not declined at all. The left ear hasn't gotten worse. No hearing changes with changes in the seasons, which he's had before, which is common in people with Meniere's. He's not had that, so he's been stable. Three years later, right? So three years later, no Meniere's symptoms in the last three years. Right? Now, I know some of you are like, well, how can that be? It's because we got to the root of it, right? We got to the root of it. What about seven years? I originally saw this gentleman seven years ago from this year. He's still having no Meniere symptoms in seven years, right? He did consult me for another issue that was related to uh, iron and red blood cells, but he's having no Meniere symptoms in seven years, which is phenomenal, right? It's phenomenal. So what I want you to take away from this case, if you have Meniere's, I don't care what you've been told. I don't care what you've already tried. There is usually hope if you do the right kind of testing, you find the right doctor that knows these things that we've been talking about, that knows how to you know, examine someone's history and understands that Meniere's is very likely an inflammatory problem. You got to track down the inflammation, knows what type of treatment plans to use. How do you know if the treatment's working? You know, what's next? So what I'm telling you is don't settle. Don't settle. If you have Meniere's that's, that's not stable, you're still getting hearing loss fluctuations, you're still getting tinnitus, you're still getting vertigo and dizziness. It's time to find someone that knows these things that we talked about, right? Uh, so I'm also giving you this video today as, a, as, a, as a, a beacon of hope because I've treated a lot of Meniere's patients over the last 20 years and the vast majority of them, the vast majority of them uh, have had significant improvement. So again, make sure you're working with a doctor that understands all these topics that we've talked about today and I wish you the best. So I'll see you next time.